summer 2014. I mean, it is beautiful in the Okanagan. The weather is fine, uh, fairly clear, sunny, hot. We're on our way down to Osoyoos, British Columbia. Now, this is a very unique part of Canada. It's a desert. But it's a desert that's unique because there's water around it. It's in a valley. It's a very small strip of land. Now, this video isn't about travel and tourism, although you're going to see Osoyoos and the valley as we drive through it all the way to Oliver. It has to do with food production because this valley that was a true desert was inhabited early by European settlers. People coming from Germany, Portugal, uh, Czechoslovakia at that time, Hungary, wherever people were arriving, Europeans, they worked their butt off, clearing the land, channeling in the water for ir irrigation, which is vital to farming and agriculture, and started growing goods. Now, since then, many things have changed. Their kids have gone off to university. They sold their farms. It's, today, it's uh, a lot of the farms are owned by Asians, uh, East Indians to be specific. But uh, farming remains a main part of the economy. Farming, uh, orchards, grapes for wine production, all these things are still going. As the area has also evolved into a tourist destination, and this is all within the last 30 years. You know, they got the motels, hotels, uh, residential lots, vacation homes, and it's become a retirement destination, again, because of the great climate, golf nearby, all these different things so the area continues to evolve when you look down as you're coming from the mountain down into the valley you can see all the green of the agriculture and this that's what this video is about agriculture food production and something that we're not talking much about is the food security for the next generations to come as more and more people live in cities today around the world food security is such an important issue along with our uh, need for clean air, water, environmental protection, food security is going to be driving the countries of the future. Now, right now, I came across some articles on BBC World Report about a bird flu outbreak that's spreading across Europe, and it's just really opened up my eyes as I started looking at the news on Google, on the internet, and I never realized that, like, the Dutch had a very vital uh, agricultural industry 203,000 chickens had to be destroyed uh, and that the Dutch are producing not only chickens but eggs 2,000 Dutch businesses with more than a hundred million chickens produce more than 10 billion eggs a year more than 6 billion of them destined for export now what does this have to do with us in the United States or Canada a heck of a lot because what we have now in this world is a globalized economy globalization there are free trade deals between the United States and Canada and Europe United States and Canada with Asia with Central America we've got all these free trade agreements in place which most people don't even know the details about because government leaders along with their business uh, counterparts head off to these countries sign all kind of trade agreements and we're left out in the dark but here's what's happening think about this we have free trade agreement with Europe Europe is facing a crisis because of the bird flu birds have had to be destroyed in uh, uh, Germany United Kingdom across EU along with eggs they have a free trade agreement with North America awesome isn't it they can come to North America and buy from our producers holy smokes that's how free trade supposed to work the only thing is that when you're in a supply and demand economy, when their supply vanishes because of a bird flu and having to call animals, and they come to North America, they're taking out of our supply. Suddenly a large chunk of birds and eggs could be heading off to uh, Europe, or alternatively they could be heading off to Asia. And since they are buying at market prices, market rates, you can bet your pants that our prices are going up. We're going to be paying more because the producers have the option of selling locally for lower price or selling to foreign buyers at a higher price. It's, an, it's a no-brainer. But there are so many other things that are being impacted. It's not only about you going to the grocery store and paying more for your eggs or your chicken. 
check out restaurant prices go for a breakfast you know have some uh, bacon and eggs and see what the prices are and this is happening globally because we are seeing impacts in all food areas as extreme weather is also impacting our life we're seeing extreme weather impacting california with droughts and uh, parts of south america central america australia is being impacted by extreme weather so what we're seeing is that the price of food has suddenly started climbing to levels i can't i could not have imagined a couple of years ago I just mentioned in a video recently that we used to pay like 79 cents for English cucumbers. Today they're $1.99. Grapefruit used to be bought by the pound. They're a buck 45 each. Pomegranates are now coming in for the fall season. They're a buck 45 each. Uh, cantaloupes being imported. They're over four bucks for a cantaloupe in our grocery stores. So the price of food is going up and this is also happening in the restaurant and food industries around North America. Now the other thing is it's not just about poultry. This year I heard a lot of news in the summertime about this awful disease that was killing swine, pigs, hogs all across North America from the United States to uh, Canada and uh, just doing this video, I started doing a little bit of looking around on the internet, and what I found is absolutely unbelievable. And that brings me to a question. Do you know what the food you're eating is eating? Because it turns out to, uh, that I just found this article about piglets. And it appears that the virus called porcine epidemic diarrhea virus has been at least in part traced back to pig's blood being used in piglet feed. It appears that they're collecting blood from slaughterhouses to be fed to young piglets starting out their life. And the USDA is allocating a total of $4 million for research to develop a vaccine against the disease. I mean, give me a break. How much does the U.S. spend on the military in a military operation like in Iraq on one single day? So to put $4 million bucks out against uh, to come up with a vaccine against a virus is ridiculous aside of the simple fact that we should maybe re-examine what we're feeding to the animals remember when mad cow disease came out and it turned out that uh, animal bones were being ground up and fed to cattle that uh, if the bones had disease in them would really screw up the cattle and suddenly you couldn't sell uh, North American cattle to anyone around the world because they were afraid of it and we still don't know if that's going to have an impact on humans. There's still a lot of research out there that says that there's a generation that will be having a lot of impact from the food they've eaten. Those steaks that you loved and you barbecued and are sold, they might have an impact on you. It's not only, by the way, North America. I believe the mad cow disease was first detected in the United Kingdom. It is a global crisis, what is happening to our food security. On top of that, we have everything from uh, extreme weather events, droughts, flooding, hail. So basically what I'm trying to get at is that our food supply is threatened. Seven billion people on the planet today, it's pr uh, gonna increase to nine billion, I think by 2050, keep increasing continually. How is that going to work when we have less clean water, fresh water, aquifers are depleted, aquifers are polluted. It's just come out recently that one of the aquifers uh, has pollution in, it in the United States. Uh, and then on top of that, you have uh, the food being unhealthy to humans, unhealthy. It's, it, it, this should be a major discussion, but it seems like anything that has a negative impact isn't being discussed. We're going to talk about hope and looking for that bright light up on the hillside and uh, change and all that stuff. And I guess in my videos, I tend to focus somewhat on the negative because somebody had to help better look at what's happening in our world. What is happening to the food supply and maybe try to come up with a solution not just for today but look down the road you know if we're going to say we're going to have this many people on the planet in 2050 
and we're seeing that climate change, extreme weather events are taking an impact, and we're seeing that water quality is diminishing and that even water supplies are diminishing, what are we going to do? Cindy and I have noticed, and I've made a lot of videos about how high the price of our food is going very quickly. I mean, it just seems like in a matter of a couple of years, it suddenly has started to go crazy. We used to buy uh, grapefruit from Texas and Florida by the pound. It used to come in cello bags. Today you're buying it by the piece at $1.45 each. Our English cucumbers went from $0.79 cents each to $1.99. We're seeing the price of lettuce, tomatoes, everything going up. And it's one thing for the prices to go up for people that can afford it or can maybe alter their diet. But remember that there are billions of people on this planet who do not have that option. There are people by the millions, hundreds of millions, working in a poverty-driven economy. In Asia, there's people that spend the most of their money on food. They, the money they earn working in the factories to put out clothing and stuff that we in the West consume, they're spending on food and not in an extent like we do. And yet, like I said, I'm seeing our prices going up. People are moving into cities. More population lives in cities. They're not going to have the opportunity to go out to local farms and uh, local producers and buy local. They'll be buying everything in the stores. It doesn't matter how it gets there, where it gets there from how it's produced, what it's fed, whatever, they're buying stuff in the stores. And that's maybe good. Maybe the only thing you want to know about your chicken is that it comes in a cello pack. You know, you go and buy a couple of chicken uh, drumsticks or a chicken breast, skinless, boneless, and that's all you care about is that it comes from there, but it doesn't just come from there. Maybe your chicken comes from China. Maybe your chicken comes from Canada. Or you don't know where it's coming from. And... Recently, when America tried to have labels put on their food about where it's coming from, industry pushed back. Industry doesn't want you to know. Industry doesn't want you to know if your food contains GMO, genetically modified organisms. It's not about, you know, everyone being afraid of it. It doesn't matter what you think, but maybe you should have the right to know what is in your food. Maybe there should be labels on food or in the stores about what they contain, what kind of pesticides, herbicides, what's used in any specific area. We already know that apples, apples are a big industry in British Columbia, Ontario, down in the United States, Washington, Oregon. They use all kinds of pesticides on them continually. What's the nutritional impact? What's the impact of children? I mean, we see the diseases are breaking out all different kinds in humans. We're being impacted. It's said that, uh, you know, Canadians are having so many issues with different uh, diseases and it's just going to get worse. Is maybe our food to some extent responsible for this? There's so many questions that need to be answered. Cindy and I still love to support our local agriculture. Whenever we can, we go out and buy local. But in our climate, as I said in the previous video, it's not possible in the winter. You go out in July, August, September even, and you can buy local. You can uh, get good produce at a great price. I mean, price is important for us also, like it is important for most of the people around the world. We drive down to Oliver because we get a better price than in Kelowna. A lot of variety of reasons for that. But we do support local, but we can't do it year-round. We are dependent on food that is imported. Cindy and I are down here in Oliver where we come to get our food, fruit and vegetables. And we've loaded up on tomatoes. We're buying boxes of them. It's uh, basically uh, 50 cents a pound. We load it up on nectarines, and that's a, a huge bag full of them, plus there's more elsewhere. We've got peaches. Peaches are, again, 50 cents a pound. We've got Hungarian hot peppers. 
and those came in at 85 cents a pound, freshly picked. They were just picked. And again, like I said, we got lots of other stuff. It's, uh, I got a couple of peaches you wouldn't believe. They're further down in this pile, but uh, look at the size of this peach. Now that's a pure, pure peach. It's not Georgia peach. That's a humongous, humongous peach. Juicy. That is going in my stomach as soon as we get home. That's, that's a done deal. It's, it's soft. Oh man, that's going to be delicious. So we, we do support local farmers and we've talked about this before. But at the same time, I will tell you that we don't shop around Kelowna. We drive down to Oliver or Soyuz because the prices are so much cheaper. They're off the beaten path somewhat. Like Kelowna is a vacation mecca. People come from Alberta all over and then they go to the fruit stands and pay ridiculous prices for stuff. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was getting cherries down here for a dollar a pound when in Kelowna they were charging three dollars a pound for local cherries. And uh, same with everything else like that. So you can get lots of produce here, inexpensive. And uh, in the summertime, what we love to do is eat fresh food, right from farmers, right from the orchards, right from the farms. And uh, the taste, flavor, smell, I mean, it, it's unreal. I can already tell you that going home in our car, the smell from all the fresh stuff is gonna be unreal. So, now, I said that the smell of the uh, peaches and peppers and all that stuff was overwhelming. You have no idea what the smell of the fresh, just picked cantaloupe and honeydew is like. It's hard to see when you can really. Yeah. Regrettably, I know that the uh, produce, food that's grown out here is also sprayed with pesticides. And for the most part, we don't have a choice. We would be willing to pay an extra five cents a pound for tomatoes, peppers, anything like that, if it meant it was organic. But the choice doesn't exist. Farmers, to a great extent, can't gamble. Because, you know, they could be growing their crop and then a, a pest comes in and wipes it all out. They have no insurance against that. They can't gamble on it. So they got to do whatever they can to maximize their money so that they can be in business it's a business but uh, it would be great to know what is in our food when we buy it and uh, as consumers that should be a right that we all have at least that's the way Cindy and I see it Cindy and I have seen a lot more pickier own signs all over the uh, orchards than we've seen previously and I wonder if there's any issue with getting uh, pickers in the area. 24 cans of beer, 37.95. That's an awesome price. Not. And for Pete's sakes, we do need regulatory agencies in there that would decide that there are some things that are not right to do no matter what. Animals that are not carnivores shouldn't be fed stuff like blood or dried up bones. I mean, we've even heard scary stories about what's being fed to uh, farm, uh, farm salmon and stuff. So these things do have to be regulated. I mean, it's fine when they put regulations on ordinary people, what you're allowed to do, what you can't do. But it just seems like many industries have uh, the lobbying ability and the lobbying funds to keep regulators away from them. And that just isn't right when it comes to our own safety and health.